Bibles tonight with me to Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter number 32. Sometimes I have a hard time getting away from the book of Psalms. You've heard it said a thousand times, the book of Psalms was the children of Israel's hymn book. And the Psalms are the ebb and flow of life. If you are in a particular mood in a certain day, find a Psalm that reflects your current mood and begin to read that thing. And just keep reading and reading and reading. And you'll, I believe, you'll notice a change in yourself and your attitude as the writer of the Psalm attitude changes. Many times you look through the book of Psalms and we'll say David, for instance, and I mean, he is angry. I mean, he's saying, you know, God kill those wicked, evil, ungodly people. And I mean, he's just pouring his heart out before God. And you just continue reading that thing and reading that thing. And man, by the time you get to the end of it, he's talking about how good God is and how holy he is and all of those various things. And uh, I'm telling you, church, we we just don't we don't put as much stock in the word of God as what we should. I mean, so many, so many people, they turn to the beer bottle, the pill bottle, the this, that and the other when when life hurts. And they ought to be turning to the word of God. They ought to be turning to the house of God. They ought to be turning to the children of God to get help. We're, we're looking for what we need in all the wrong places. And I know you know that, or you wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night on a beautiful evening like this evening. You'd be sitting home on the porch with a glass of sweet tea listening to the birds chirp. You don't have to tell me, I know, because if I wasn't here, that's what I'd be doing. Psalm 32. I mean, it, 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 it's hard for me to realize a week from tonight, revival will almost be over. Monday night, 7 o'clock. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 7 o'clock. Brother Travis will be here. He's excited to be here because he's never been here before. The, the more that I, I talk to my friends in the south and east, I'm hearing more and more of... Christians who just go through the motions. And, and they're, some of these guys are, are talking about when they, when they go to revival meetings, yeah, people are shouting, they're swinging from the chandeliers, they're, they're running the aisles, but as soon as church is over, there's no change. There's no lasting change in people's lives. That's why it's refreshing for some of these guys who typically haven't preached up here in the past to come up here because the, the, the people aren't as used to it, if you will. And it's fresh to us and, and we respond. Um, and, and so uh, I, I've been trying to get as many of my friends from down there up here as I possibly can. Uh, number one, because I love them. I want to spend time with them. But I want you folks to be exposed to them so that you can learn to love them the way that I have learned to love them. And, uh, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm looking forward to next week. Uh, Brother Travis is not your everyday, average, ordinary evangelist. I'm just going to warn you. He was a Marine. And I, I, oh, I hope he tells some of those, some of those stories. I mean, because they're, they're powerful. And I know some of you have been, uh, watching some of his stuff on Facebook, but we need to begin to pray for that, not just for the meeting next week, but we must pray for revival. You say, preacher, I've heard that all of my life. What are you talking about? We need to pray that God's people, the church of the living God, gets everything out of our lives so that God can speak to us and we can hear him unhindered. Revival is just 
renewing our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so easy for to allow things to get in the way. I, I, and I'm, I'm as guilty or more guilty than most people I know. And, and, and it should not be that. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm the pastor of the church. But sometimes the most backslidden person is the person that stands in front of the church. Why? Because we get so, we get so in the ministry, in doing the ministry, that we think that we're really doing something spectacular when, in fact, we're just going through the motions. I mean, that's why I do not like a dry, dull, boring church service. I don't like for people to come to church and say, okay, we're going to sing two songs. There's going to be a prayer. We're going to take up an offering. We're going to sing a third song. The pastor's going to crack a joke. Then he's going to have a sermon. That's not church. That's just an over-glorified social club. I, my, my desire is that church is fresh and alive every time we come through the door. The problem is, is in some churches, we got so many, so many stuffed shirts that had so much starch in them that they, they can't bend over to pick a penny up off the floor if they had to. They're out there, church. I'm not saying our church is like that, but I'm saying there are churches out there that it, you'd hear snap, crackle, pop if they'd been over to pick up a penny off the floor because they got so much starch. That's free. Here in Psalm 32, Psalm 32 is what I would consider, and I'm not a theologian nor a Bible scholar, or do I claim to be one? But I would consider Psalm 32 as a partner to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, as we have talked about before, is, is David getting right with God after his sin with Bathsheba. And people who know a lot more about history and things have said they believe that David actually went about three days living under the judging hand of God before he repented and got right. Three days. And my guess is it's probably the longest three days of his entire life. But you can couple Psalm 32 with Psalm 51. Let's look tonight at Psalm 32 and verse 1. The Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the draught of summer. Selah. When you see that word selah, that is a musical pause. What the writer is saying Hang on a minute. Let's think about what we've just talked about. He's telling us to stop and ponder what, what he has just written, what he has just said. Mull it over in your mind. Think about it. Meditate on it. So, I didn't open in prayer, did I? I'm worse than I thought. I told you I need revival. But let's pray and we'll jump into this. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for the precious word of God that we can have it in our own language. We can read it. We can study it. And Father, we can, as we look into it tonight, it is your love letter to us, your people. Now, Father, I pray that you'd help me tonight. Lord, you know that I'm not able to accomplish the task at hand. But Precious Holy Ghost of God, if you'll anoint me with that fresh oil that it takes to make preaching, if you'll give me unction that I might function tonight, we'll accomplish something here for the cause of Christ. I pray, Father, that your word would go forth in power and demonstration of the Spirit. I pray, precious Holy Ghost of God, that you would speak to our hearts through the word of God tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David, we see, has been experiencing divine chastening and forgiveness. 
If you want to look back at what took place, we, we're all fairly familiar. Second Samuel chapter 11 is David's sin with Bathsheba. We know he stayed home from the battle when he should have went. He, because he stayed home, he was out nosing around looking, seeing things he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have seen. He saw a young woman named Bathsheba out on the roof of her place taking a bath. He should have never seen that because he should have been in battle in, 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 uh, as the king of the nation. And he should have been in battle with his troops. He stayed home. He saw. Then what? He sent for her. After he sent for her, what happened? He sinned. That would have never taken place at that time on that night if David had have went to battle the way that he should have. He stayed, he saw, he sent, and he sinned big time. We see in Psalm 51, the companion of this chapter, that that is David's psalm of repentance. And I mean, I'm telling you, it is, a, it is one of my favorite psalms to preach from. If the Lord would let me, I'd preach from it all the time. I mean, I just love it that much. It means that much to me. But tonight we find our place in Psalm 32. And as we look at verses 1 and 2, I want to look at the blessing of forgiveness. The blessing of forgiveness. What am I talking about? I'm talking about church that in just a few short days, we're going to have a revival meeting with evangelist Travis Kerlock. But there are some things that you and I need to do as God's people to get ready to have revival. Revival is not a message although it is. Revival is not a method, although it is. Revival is not a messenger, although we will have one. Revival is not just a meeting, though we are planning on having one. Revival is a renewed obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just guessing that most people are just like me, and we could do just a little bit better in the obedience department. Because I know I can. So here in verses 1 to 2, we see the blessing of obedience, of forgiveness. Or if you want to say it down home, the blessing of confessing. In verses 1 and 2, the psalmist, having received God's forgiveness for his sin, is expressing joy over that fact. The word blessed is used in Psalm 1 and verse 1. What is, what is David saying in Psalm 1 and verse 1? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And what happens? He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaves shall not wither. Mm. I'm telling you, all of those blessings that we get the joy that we can receive in having a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is used of a person who leads an untarnished life. Here in this chapter, it's used of one who has forgiveness. God has forgiven him fully and completely and does not count a truly penitent person's sin against them. What am I saying? When we confess our sin and forsake it, we ask God for forgiveness and He forgives it. That sin is gone. It will be remembered against us no more in God's court. Now the dirty dog devil, he'll bring it up all the time. Why? Because he knows he can't make you unsaved, but he can make you miserable in your salvation. That's why he keeps bringing this garbage up against us. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103 and verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. How far is east from west? The long way. Think about this with me. You can leave this church right now in Avon, and you can go north. You can go north all the way into Canada. You can go north all the way to the Arctic Circle. But there's going to come a point where you're going to pass a magic dot that if you were looking at a map or a globe, there would be a dot there. And when you pass that, guess what? Now you're going south. 
You can, you can keep going south until you'll get to that magic point again. Guess what? Now you're going back north. Now, let's turn this thing around. Let's leave this parking lot and let's go east. Drive as fast as we can through Indianapolis and keep going east. You can go east, you can go east, and you can go east until the cows come home and you will continue to go east. You will never go west until you stop and turn around and go the other way. That is exactly how far God has taken our sin away from us, as far as the east is from the west. Like the old black preacher said, the Lord took my sin, put them in the deepest part of the sea, posted a sign, no fishing. But what do we do? And we pull it back up. We need to leave it there. The blessings of forgiveness. David knew something about the blessings of forgiveness. We see in the first part of verse 1, he said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That word transgression is an interesting word. It means a revolt. A revolt. When we transgress against God, we are leading a revolt of our own against the God of heaven. That is exactly what David is saying that he had done when he sinned with Bathsheba. He knew it was wrong. But he yielded to the flesh and committed sin. Not only did he commit sin with Bathsheba, but then he committed murder in having Uriah the Hittite murdered by the, the, uh, the armies that they were fighting against. I mean, he is doubly guilty. And he is living under the weight of his transgression, his revolt. Blessed is he whose transgression is what? Forgiven. I love the word picture here. That word forgiven means to lift. Means to lift. You ever been so concerned about something you felt like the weight of the world was resting on your shoulders and then when it didn't come to pass, it's like, whew. forgiveness. That's a picture of forgiveness, to lift. All that guilt, all that shame, all of that weight is gone because we're forgiven. Not only is our transgression forgiven, but our sin is covered. The word sin means an offense. I had to chuckle. The word covered means to plump up, to fill the hollows. Made me think of that junk you buy in the insulation junk you buy in the can. And you spray it in the cracks of your house to keep the wind out in the wintertime. Don't get that stuff on you because it won't come off very easy. But what do you do? You, you spray that stuff out and then what? It plumps up. That's what he's talking about. The forgiveness of God covers our sin and it swells up. And God doesn't see it anymore. When it's forgiven, it's under the blood and it's gone. What does he see? He sees the blood of Christ. Our transgression is forgiven. Our sin is covered. Then look at verse 2. He said, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. You ever think about that word blessed? What it means? It means happy. Actually, it means more than happy. It means, oh, how happy, exclamation point. So it's not just, yeah, I'm happy. No, it's like, man, I am thrilled. And he says, blessed, oh, how happy is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Imputeth, that means literally to weave or to fabricate. Now, when we trust Christ as our Savior, there is this thing of imputation. Okay, that and $12 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Okay, so, so God takes our sin off of us and imputes it 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, like a coat, like taking a coat off and putting it. So he takes Christ's righteousness off of him like a coat and puts it on you and I, and it is imputed unto us. So when God looks at us after we are born again, he does not see our sinfulness. He sees the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what he's talking about, imputing. And he's, he says, blessed, oh, how happy is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth what? Not iniquity. That word iniquity means perversity, moral evil. Notice the progression here when he's talking about sin. It gets just a little bit worse and a little bit worse and a little bit worse. He imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit is no guile. Guile, that means treachery or deceit. You know, there's some people out there that if their lips are moving, they're lying. Most of them run political ads on TV. I'm just telling it like it is. If a politician's lips are moving, they're lying. Amen. There's people out there in the world that we deal with that are exactly the same way. If their lips are moving, they're lying. I have been around people that that is all that they could do. I mean, if you give them $100, they couldn't have told the truth. I mean, it's so sad. They live a lie. I, I've had friends over the years. One, one friend in particular, we knew each other since junior high. Every time we were together, every time we were together, he'd tell me, I'll call you tomorrow. You know how long it's been since I've been in junior high? I'm still waiting on him to call. I'm not holding my breath. Love the guy dearly, but he ain't going to call. And I know he don't mean it. He don't mean anything by it. But if you don't mean it, don't say it. Imputeth not iniquity. Hmm. And in whose spirit there is no guile. So the blessing of forgiveness. We don't have to live under the weight and the shame and the guilt. We can get forgiveness and we can, man, we can just let that thing go. But some people, some people choose to live under it. So, Secondly, we see in verses 3 through 5, we see the chastening of the unrepentant. I'm telling you, if people will not turn from their sin, God will pour it on to the place that they will wish they had. Of. I mean, God is a perfect gentleman. He won't force anybody to make any decision that they don't want to. But I guarantee you they'll wish they had. They will. The chastening of the unrepentant. In verses 3, 4, and 5, the psalmist experienced forgiveness when he acknowledged his sin, but it comes only after divine chastening. When he was silent and did not confess his sin, he was weakened physically and grieved inwardly. It makes me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when we, when we partake in communion. What does the Apostle Paul warn us against? He warns, he warns us against partaking unworthily. Why? Because there were people in the church at Corinth that had partaken unworthily in an unworthy manner. And Paul straight up says, some are sick and some sleep. And he's not talking about taking a Sunday afternoon nap. What he's saying is that, that it, was, it was such an offense before God that they died. If we continue to refuse to repent of our sin, there will come a day when God says, that's it, I'm done. There is a deadline, but we don't like to think about that. This, he, he, when he was silent and did not confess his sin, he was physically weakened and grieving inwardly. The hand here, or is referring to the, the Lord's power, was heavy on him in verse 4. In other words, God was dealing severely with him. I mean, if our children sinned against us, 
and, and some some parents do. Oh, now, now you shouldn't do that. Go take a time out. Now, come here, boy. Anyway, I'm not going down that road tonight. That's another sermon for another night. So, this expression could refer to physical illness with burning fever, or it may describe in poetic language his remorse of his conscience. He was so sorry for what he did. I mean, I cannot imagine the guilt and the shame and the hurt and everything that David lived under, even for three days, if it was three days, after not only committing adultery with a woman, but then having her husband murdered. And this is what he lived under. But then, then he confessed his sin. And what happened when he confessed his sin? Restoration took place. In verses 3 and 4, we see the bitterness. David here is describing his agony before he confessed his sin. He said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the draught of summer. Selah. Hmm. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. He is describing his agony before he confessed his sin. And boy, was he was he living under it. The, the phrase waxed old there means to be frail, to wear out. He was weak. He was miserable. His strength was gone. That blessedness that he had known and enjoyed was gone. Fellowship was now broken. <coughs> David describes the joy he had after he confessed his sin and got forgiveness in Psalm 51. And we don't have time to go there. We're pretty much out of time. But sometime, just, just take a few minutes and read Psalm 51. Uh, I'm hoping the Lord will let me preach through that psalm again sometime. Thirdly, we see in verses 6 through 11, we see the advice of the forgiven. The advice of the forgiven. Who, who would you rather receive advice from? Somebody that's read about it or somebody that's been through it? I mean, when I want advice, I call people that I know that have, have experienced what I want advice about. I don't, you know, if I'm going to work on my truck, do I want, do I want the, the owner's manual from General Motors? Or do I want to go to the, do they even have bookstores anymore? I mean, I remember growing up, you could go, you could go, oh, I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus. You could go to Guarantee Auto in Brownsburg. And you could talk to my dad's cousin, Leon, who managed it. And you could get a manual that was made by somebody else. But would I trust it? You could trust those Chilton manuals. I mean, they were reputable. But I don't want something written by Billy Joe Jim Bob. Because he may just be selling manuals to make a buck. We see David is now encouraging others to seek the Lord because... God deals graciously with sinners. He, he deals with them in love, but He still deals with them in justice. You see, just because we repent does not take away the consequences of our sin. We, I mean, there's still, I mean, if we throw a rock into a, into a pond that is calm, what happens? There's ripples. There is cause and effect. If I sin, there's the cause, and the consequences are the effect. There's no getting away from it. The time to pray is when the Lord may be found. If this is done, we can. these calamities that David speaks about may not overwhelm us. In verse 8, we see David is now counseling others not to refuse to submit to the Lord until he forces it. Obey God now, 
Don't, don't, don't put your place, don't put yourself in a place where chastisement is going to come upon you because you don't want that. Believe me, he is more than willing to do it. In verses 9 through 11, the psalmist advised his readers to submit to the Lord rather than resist stubbornly like a horse or a mule that has to be controlled. Man, that brought back fond memories growing up on the farm. We had hay burners, horses, and I mean, some of them were so stinking stubborn. I mean, ugh. it was kind of funny. I've been, I've been uh, watching a homesteading family on, on YouTube, and uh, yesterday I was watching an episode. They had sold some miniature mules, and... I almost laughed out loud because they were going to deliver them after they got out of church. So they put the mules in the trailer, took truck and trailer to church, and after church they went and delivered. The, can you imagine what that church service sounded like? Yeehaw! <laughs> the last one wouldn't go up in the trailer. And he got behind it, kind of to the side, you know, because they'll kick and their hooves can be razor sharp. And he began to push on the back side of that stupid mule. And that dumb mule got hoofs up in the trailer and then went like this. And I'm telling you, if they're not on a slick surface when they do that, you're done. But he kept pushing, pushing, and pushing, slid back, slid that fool thing up in the trailer until the back feet hit the trailer and he whopped them on the backside and pushed a little bit more and it finally got the message and up in the trailer it went wham slammed the door shut why is it we got to be like that why is it we have to be like that we shouldn't be but the interesting thing here about David, starting about verse 8, now David has become the counselor. And he's telling people, hey, look, here's what you need to do. Don't do what I've done. Do it this way, and you will save yourself so much problem. In verse 6, we see the pattern. In verse 7, we see the, the protector. He said, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. That hiding place is a cover. Where he's talking about to preserve, that means to guard or to protect. Then in verses 8 through 11, we see the, the commission that David is giving. He tells us in verse 8 and verse 10 what the Lord would do. The Lord promised to lead the king, David. Why? All that sin was out of his life. And now, now he was in a place to yield himself to God and to be led of God. And he promised to lead the king. Not only did he promise to lead the king, but he promised to love the king. His love for David never changed one bit while David was out in sin. He knew before the foundation of the earth what was going to take place, and he loved David anyway. But he did not love what he was doing, what he was engaged in. In verses 9 and 10, David tells us what the king should do. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit, and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come pass him about. Man, I could tell you story after story after story about the bridles. And I'm telling you, horses and mules hate bridles. But if you want them to go somewhere, it's a necessity. Why? Because that part of their mouth is tender. And if you want something to happen, you just give a little tug on that bridle and you have their undivided attention. When I was growing up, I had a horse, and the bridle that I had for that horse, the part that went through his mouth, it right in the middle had a U-shape in it. And across that U-shape was a little metal post, and on that metal post was a metal ball. 
You know why? Give the dumb thing something to play with in his mouth. Keep him occupied. Keep him out of foolishness. So when you pull back on that bridle, it stopped. Why? A little bit of pain. And David is telling us we should not be like the horse or the mule. We should just... And, and we, had, we had some horses that if you walked out into the barn lot, I mean, they were right there, almost with their head up against you. I mean, if you stopped, boom, they'd run into you. Why? They were following. Number one, they had to be Baptist horses. They thought she's going to feed them. But that's the kind of obedience that we need. We need to follow Him unconditionally. We need to obey unconditionally when it comes to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes, church, sometimes we get to be like that horse or like that mule and we get a mind of our own and we want to do our own thing, our own way. And then He has to just check up on us a little bit. Just pull back on the reins a little bit and let that bit do its work. And that's what David's talking about here. So as we, as we think about revival coming next week, we need to, we need to do a, an inventory in our own lives. Are we where we should be with the Lord? I mean, hey, I'm not, I'm not totally ignorant. It's Wednesday night, and I know who's here, okay? But I don't know your heart. You could sit in church. I've known people sit in church for years. They look like Christian. They acted like Christian. They talk like Christian. They even cooked like Christians. They weren't Christians. I know who my audience is this evening. But, but church, I, we have got to get ready for revival next week. We've got to be ready for it. I don't want us to miss what God has for us next week. I mean, next week could be the week that revival breaks out at El Bethel Baptist Church and spreads all through Indiana and just takes off. It could be. It really could be. And by the way, the next week starts the Midwest Tent Revival. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be incredible to see revival start here next week and then spread to Crawfordsville the next week for two weeks in a row? And then from Crawfordsville, it spread someplace else and just see this thing take off. I, I would be beside myself. I mean, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to be around me. I'd be so happy. I'd be, oh, how happy! Exclamation point. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.